Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Dark Travels hostess. For tonight's podcast, we head to our first American destination, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. No passports required, and certainly no bad French tonight. Oh, Philadelphia, Philly for short, or the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia has got to be one of America's most haunted cities. And knowing its long and lengthy history, especially its significance during the American Revolution, it undoubtedly has a lot of energy here. Tonight, we're going to discuss Edgar Allan Poe, the man who inspired the dark themes of literature with The Raven, The Fall of the House of Usher, and Murders at the Rue Morgue. But, in essence, the idea of dark tourism. Tonight... I also have a fun little contest that I will delve into at the end of my podcast. But in the meantime, we're going to travel to some of Philly's seriously haunted places. And some of them, ladies and gents, you can actually host your own paranormal investigations in. Or some of them you can actually spend the night at. So let's head to our first stop, Edgar Allan Poe's house. Now, I've been to Philly myself, and sadly, I did not go to Poe's house. And I think I should warn you, it's kind of not in the best economically suited neighborhood. But still, it's a very important stop. It's our first stop in Philly. Now, Poe, who had a hard life and a curious death, even though they do believe they solved what may have been his demise... Uh, He was actually happiest when he lived here in Philadelphia. He lived in Philadelphia for a total of six years, during which he wrote Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Fall of the House of Usher, The Pit and the Pendulum, The Gold Bug, and Black Cat, just to name a few. And it is believed that he began working on the Raven whilst here. Now, in case you did not know it, but Poe actually launched the detective genre with Murders in the Rue Morgue. And, on a slighter scale, he launched the true crime genre with his tale, The Mystery of Marie Rogat. Many argue that his detective, C. Auguste Dupin, set the stage for Sherlock Holmes, Perrault, Perry Mason. <laughs> Remember Perry Mason, guys? My father, actually, still watches him. It's almost... Like it's a senior thing, I don't really know. But either way, the point is, is that Poe basically blazes the trail for the hundreds of detectives to come. But he is most remembered for sculpting the gloomy, gothic tales of revenge, disease, symbolism, horror, and claustrophobic creepiness. He is basically the father of the the macabre movement. His museum is located at 532 North 7th Street. Now, you will know you are in the right place if you see a large statue of a raven out front. And how poetic. Get it? Poetic. (laughs) Anywho, sorry. At this museum, which was his former home, it is this cellar that they believe where he based his story, Black Cat, in. Now, the... They, they meaning the national parks, they did not know what his house looked like during his stay, so they decided not to redecorate it in similar fashion, you know, with furniture of the their he- of his heyday. The museum itself is notably small, and you can begin your tour with an eight-minute video about Poe's life. Now, if you are seeking national park stamps, or if you're a letterboxer, they have stamps here. 
It is open Friday through Sunday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It closes for lunch between 12 and 1, and admission is free. It is about a mile from the Liberty Bell, so you can Uber, Lyft, taxi, or take the SEPTA, which is the bus system, SEPTA Route 47, which is uh, the bus stop is right around the corner. And one TripAdvisor commenter recommends reading Black Cat or The Raven before coming. Now, moving on from Poe's place, let's talk Penn. Penn, as in penitentiary. The Eastern State Penitentiary, in fact. If you haven't heard about the Eastern State Penitentiary, you're in for a treat. Built in 1829, this prison had a very different perspective regarding rehabilitation and redemption for its prisoners. Their perspective was that people were inherently good and that after some solitude and some quiet reflection, criminals would repent on their very own and in turn rehabilitate themselves. So the prisoners were subjected to 23 hours of solitude each day. They showered every two weeks. They were forced to wear hoods or masks so they couldn't see where they were going or see other inmates. And if they spoke, they were punished. It seemed to me like they were very much forced to live the lives of monks in, in a monastery. Only these prisoners were left in the dark, given only bread and water, while some were confined in straitjackets and gagged. Basically, what ended up happening is that these tactics drove several of the inmates literally insane. In fact, so many ended up taking their own lives. Women were prisoners there for about 60 years as well. And of the two most mentioned men who were at Eastern State Pen, one was a hardened criminal and the other was a hardened warden. Let's talk Al Capone. Coming from the gangster circuit of Chicago, Al Capone, a.k.a. Scarface, was a serious motherfucker. And he was treated as one. He was the only prisoner to have the comforts of actual furniture in his cell. He had a lamp, a desk, some paintings to lighten the walls, and a cabinet radio in his cell, all of which are still there. Now, bear in mind, not everyone thought Uncle Al was a bad guy. Using some of the monies that he obtained from illegal bootlegging, he set up food lines during the Great Depression. And he advocated and got milk regulations passed. You see, he actually had an uncle who got sick from drinking bad milk. And so Uncle Al pushed for healthy and safe regulations regarding milk and its expiration date. So yes, every time you see an expiration date on your milk carton, you can thank Uncle Al. He pushed not only for, for the safety regulations, but he also pushed for free milk for children to help the children avoid getting rickets. But he also had something no one else wanted. He had an incurable STD. You know, a sexually transmitted disease. If you didn't know this, the man actually had syphilis. And this disease may or may not have contributed to what transpired during his seventh month stint at Eastern State. You see... While Capone feared no living man, he did fear a dead man, Jimmy. Jimmy, or better known as James Jimmy Clark. Now, he was one of the seven men Capone had massacred at the Valentine's Day Massacre. Even though Jimmy was a lower-level mob leader, he wasn't happy that Uncle Al killed him. So Jimmy decided to haunt Al Capone for the rest of his life. And the haunting began... You guessed it, at Eastern State Pen. Prison guards and other inmates could hear Al Capone crying, apologizing, and sometimes screaming for Jimmy to leave him alone. Other nights, Capone would be overheard just talking to Jimmy. After this stint, Capone would later be tried and convicted of tax evasion. For tax evasion, he got 11 years and eventually went to Alcatraz. Any guesses who went with him? You got it. It was Jimmy. Now for the warden. This guy, Herbert 
hard-boiled Smith. By the time this guy became warden, Eastern State Pen had gone from its single prisoner cell model to staffing the cells with two or three prisoners. Hard-boiled implemented various harsh punishments. One such punishment was outright starvation. He would literally starve the prisoners. Another punishment was the mad chair. And that's when they would strap a prisoner down to a chair so tightly it would cut off their circulation and restrict any type of movement. And if that wasn't enough, he would order that they would remain there in that chair for days. Another punishment utilized, especially during winter, they would dunk the prisoners in cold water and then string them up on a wall during the night to freeze. Moving past these two men and the haunted prison itself, cell block 12 is known for echoing voices and cackling. Cell block 6 has shadow figures. Cell block 4 has visions of ghostly faces. There are also silhouettes of guards on the towers. People hear footsteps, wails, whispers, especially when no one else is about. Certainly... No one is alone here, and after living such a hard life at Eastern State Penn, it is apparent that many have yet to find peace in the afterlife. Now, normally around Halloween, they do a prison event, but thanks to COVID, not this year. However, in its place, they are offering night tours. Oh, yes. This is your chance to be there at night. Tickets went on sale last month, but the tour goes on until early November. You can check out their websites for dates that work for your dark travels. Located at 2027 Fairmont Avenue, you can obviously use an Uber, a Lyft, to accept the bus routes 49, 48, 43, 32, 33, and 7. Flash Philly also makes front door stops there. Admission for the day tours are 15 for adult, 13 for seniors, 11 for students, 11 for kids 7 to 12, and 7 and under are free. Admission for the night tours are general admission and the cost of $26. Now that you have something to do at night, on top of something wonderful to do during the day, let's talk about something macabre you can do during your second day. Let's talk about the Mutter Museum. Self-dubbed as the Disturbingly Informed, it is a museum of medical history. In this museum, you will find beautifully preserved collections of atomical special models and medical instruments of the 19th century. Per their own website, the goal of the museum is to help visitors understand the mysteries and the beauty of the human body and to help them appreciate the history of diagnose and treatment. Inside this museum, you can see such things as pieces of Albert Einstein's brain, their collection of criminal and non-criminal skulls, skeletons, and over 5,000 medical instruments, as well as organs preserved in their original fluids, Chang and Bunker, the original Siamese twins, and a few Peruvian shrunken heads. Now, if the medical field is calling you or the Maccabee field is calling you, then this is your place. Now, some of the skeletons and skulls actually represent the toll that certain diseases and illnesses and the types of of various traumas that actually took on them. So you can see what certain diseases did basically to the, the human skull. This museum also includes a medicinal garden and discusses the history of natural medicines. But this place is not for the faint of heart. Like I said, we're talking body parts, we're talking organs, we're talking skeletons, diseased skulls. Either way, located at 19S 22nd Street, SEPTA's green trolley stops at Market and 2nd, just a half a block north from the museum. But... You can Uber, Lyft, taxi, or if you've got to run a car, you can drive there. It is open daily, minus, of course, a few American important holidays. 
from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's 20 bucks for adults, five for children and under are free, and all tickets must be bought online and in advance. For the medicinal garden, hours vary on the weekends, so call or check out online before you go. So we've stopped at Poe's house. We've stopped at the penthouse. Get it, penthouse. <laughs> Sorry. And we stopped at a creepy museum. On to one of my favorite places to check out. That's right, some beautiful but haunted cemetery. The Laurel Hill Cemetery is the final resting place of over 77,000 resting souls. Now, while I did spend some time trying to Google any ghost stories and not really finding any actual ghost stories, I did discover that the Laurel Hill Cemetery is extremely proud and extremely serious about its dead people. They offer a variety of tours, but more importantly, if you go to their website, you will see that they offer Victorian picnics, macabre markets, a grave digger's ball, even a rest in peace 5K run. For a place of dead, this place is very, very lively. And it has some historical people who are actually buried here. We're talking about Sarah Joseph Hale and General George Meade, to mention a few. General George Meade, obviously, in relation to the Civil War. Located at 3822 Ridge Avenue, this cemetery is open every day of the year. Their gate hours change during the winter and summer. So if you're going to um, want to double check before you get locked in. But their gift shop, museum, and main office are closed on major American holidays. Seriously, folks, I literally just said gift shop. A gift shop for a cemetery. <laughs> okay. But more importantly, not only does this place offer tours, it offers you the opportunity to do your own paranormal investigations. That's right. All you need to do is go to their website and fill out the required forms. Now, speaking of the dead and doing ghost hunt investigations, we got to talk about Fort Mifflin. So, okay, yes, leaving Philadelphia for about 20 miles is Fort Mifflin. Commissioned in 1771, Fort Mifflin, the country's only intact Revolutionary War battlefield, uh, during the War of 1812, it was a garrison. During the Civil War, it was a federal prison and a munitions depot. But not only is this place historically important, it's got some serious ghost guys. First, there's the Wailing Screaming Lady. Her name is Elizabeth Pratt. She lived there with her officer husband and her daughter, also named Elizabeth. When Elizabeth the mother learned that her daughter was seeing a soldier there, which was against the rules, she kicked her daughter out, and the daughter, shortly thereafter, became sick with hysteria and died. Elizabeth, the mother, was so overwrought at the loss of her daughter, especially since her daughter died before they could make amends, Elizabeth, the mother, killed herself in her apartment at the fort. During the day, children have seen her watching them through her apartment windows while other witnesses hear her screaming at night, longing for her daughter. Another ghost that prowls the fort is Billy Howell. Billy was a Union deserter who also killed a Union officer. Billy was the only man known to be hung at the fort, and before they hung him, they covered his face with black cloth, which was considered a sign of shame. And now, when Billy's ghost roams the fort, his ghost is faceless. Now, there are also residual ghost activity that happens at the fort. The former lamp lighter is often seen lighting his lamps on the second floor of the apartments. And former tour guides who used to reside inside the fort have reported knocking on his door every night at 3 a.m., which also was the time for the changing of the guards when the fort was active. Now, also, when this fort was active during the American Revolution, it did actually see some action. The British was trying to gain access to the fort, and as a result, over 200 men died defending the fort. In the casement where this happened, visitors tend to feel strange pains, headaches, and a heavy sadness 
that just prior they had absolutely no ailments before entering this casement. Fort Mifflin is very much aware of its ghost activity and offers people ghost tours by candlelight and a chance to sleep with the ghosts along with private investigation opportunities. Naturally, you have to plan in advance for the investigations and any tours. It is always best to buy tickets in advance and, of course, online. General admission is $8 for adults, 6 for seniors, children 6 to 12 are $6 as are vets, and children 5 and younger are free. Now, their prices do go up during their living history events. They are open from March 1st to December 15th, Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Like I said, it is 20 miles from Philadelphia, so you can drive there using your rental car, you can Uber, or you can Lyft. Lyft. <laughs> Make it sound like I'm, you're carrying something. <laughs> Sorry. Anywho. Okay, so I feel like this is even barely starting to cover Philadelphia, but I do have one last stop before we discuss food and a place to haunt. I mean, stay. Heading back to Philly, let's head to Washington Square. Now, this is a simple park, but it's got a complicated history. Washington Square was once the burial grounds for fallen soldiers and victims of the yellow fever epidemic in Philly during the 18th century. Today, it is also where the tomb of the unknown soldier and his eternal flame is located. However, this area is known to be protected by a Quaker woman named Leah. Now she, back in her heyday when she was alive, she used to protect this site from grave robbers centuries ago. So yes, basically this park equipped with a playground and swings is a cemetery for those who fought and died during the American Revolution. Located at Washington Square 217 W. Washington, you can walk, Uber, Lyft to visit this place. Now, naturally, with most of Philadelphia being haunted, it should come to no surprise that, I mean, if their parks are haunted, even some of their restaurants are haunted. So let's talk about the City Tavern. Established in 1773, it currently serves food of the culinary tradition of the colonial days. And this place is busy with a few extra peeps. I mean the ghostly peeps. First, there is the waiter who died in the duel in 1790. His body has been seen falling into the ground of the tavern. He is also blamed for tables. Uh, settings being moved, and clattering silverware. Then, in 1834, a bride, as she was getting ready for her big day, on the second floor, when a candle burned out of control, trapping her and killing her. Her bridal apparition, along with her long veil, can be seen and felt on the second floor. But the best part is, aside from being able to eat here, you can tour this place. That's right. You can walk in the footsteps of our founding fathers, eat where they ate, and learn about the history and the ghosts of this historic place. Located at 138 S. 2nd Street and Walnut Street, it is highly recommended that you make reservations. Now we have fed you ghosts, history, and food. Let's talk about scary night-night time. When I googled looking around for haunted hotels in Philadelphia, only one place kept coming up again and again. The Cornerstone Bed and Breakfast. Now, I've never been here, but guys, this place looks gorgeous. And I mean gorgeous. Per TripAdvisor, you know, my good old buddy, it has 444 reviews and 5 out of 5 stars, circles, whatevs. It's got 5 out of 5. And who is haunting this gorgeous six-room uh, place? I don't know, but the owners might. Built in 1865, a female apparition is said to softly caress people's foreheads. And you will know it is her who's doing the touchy-feely because she brings the scent of perfume. 
Another visitor has also reported having the heavy smell of cigar smoke, and others have reported the feeling of being watched the entire time they're there. Orbs and ghosts wander at night, and they love to wake people up. Now, the Cornerstone Bed and Prefix is actually TripAdvisor's Traveler's Choice for 2020. So, Ghost and Traveler's Choice Award? Wow. It's like, you really can't go wrong here. So, located at 330 Bering Street, you can make your ghostly reservations at several places, including their own website. Okay, my fellow travelers, that is basically all I have for our ghostly stops tonight. I did want to take a moment and discuss my little contest. A little backstory. When I was married the first time, I lived in Sacramento, and one of my favorite places to go was the downtown plaza. It was a wonderful outdoor mall, and at that mall, they had a game store. And I love playing games. I love doing puzzles. I love solving mysteries, obviously. And one particular day, I walked through, I looked at all their odds and ends, and I came home and I told my first husband that I wanted this game called Mummy Rummy. So he uh, he headed back over there. He looked around, couldn't find the game. So he asked the clerk, hey, where's your game, Mummy Rummy? And the clerk was like, there's never been a game called Mummy Rummy. And my, my husband was like, no, my wife was here. She saw it. She knows Mummy Rummy. And the clerk was like, there's never been a game named Mummy Rummy. And my husband was like, no, you don't understand. You're wrong. There's a game called Mummy Rummy. Well, it turns out I was wrong. It's a rare, rare thing. But I was wrong. It was called Mystery Rummy. So here's the deal. Mystery Rummy is a wonderful series of games. And one of the themes that they have is the theme Murder at the Rue Morgue. So this is how this all ties in. Your job is to send me an email at where the dark corners are at gmail.com with the year Poe wrote Murder at the Rue Morgue. And you know, when you send me that email, I will put it in the pool. And on November 19th, for that particular episode, I'll pull the name. And whoever I pull wins. I'll only say your first name. Um, but obviously, you're going to have to provide an address so I can mail the game to you. So, yes, my first contest will be the mystery rummy of Murder of the Rug Morgue. And all you need to do is send me an email. Again, at where the dark corners are at gmail.com with the year Poe penned. See how I did that? Poe penned. Murder at the Rug Mark. Okay, that's it. That's all we have. So, um, good luck to everyone. Hope to get a couple of emails. Anyways, however, if you have a place that you would someday like to see where their dark corners are or have a specific tourist attraction in mind, send me an email at where the dark corners are at gmail.com. So, until next time, please remember, only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is why I hope to meet you where the dark corners are. <laughs> <laughs>